They say a picture is worth a thousand words. They also say a picture is worth a thousand words, but it uses up three times the memory. I had a boyfriend, well, ex-boyfriend, tell me once, a picture is worth a thousand words, but every time I see a picture of you, I can only think of four. Your face is annoying. <laughs> but I think we, all, we can all agree that a picture is worth a thousand words. The right visual can dramatically enhance the effectiveness and value of a piece of communication. And in your respect, is that more true in those pictures we call infographics? These days, infographics are everywhere. They're in advertising, on the news, in books and magazines, even standing in for resumes. They're online, mobile, on TV, and of course, on the page. Companies, governments, schools, associations, candidates, everyone is using these things we call infographics. They're trendy, and some might even say on the verge of being cliche. But like them or hate them, infographics are here to stay. As long as we have the need to present data as a long and as visual communication adds impact, some form of information graphics is, is bound to be with us. The important question for those of us in the marketing communication field are, when should we use infographics? In what form? When are they effective and when are they ineffective or worse, actually detrimental to our purpose of communicating? As I mentioned, I'm so glad to be here with you today to dive deep into this very topic. As Lindsay mentioned to you, I'm the Director of Corporate Visibility for PCI. We're a marketing firm based right here in the DC metro area. And we're big believers in the power of visual communication, as long as it is tightly aligned to the marketing and communication strategy that it was designed to support. That's one reason that we have several service lines all under one roof at PCI. We want to make absolutely certain that the deliverables we produce for our clients don't lose anything in translation. But I digress. Let's get back to the topic. What do we really mean by infographic anyway? The word is simply a contraction of information graphic. So in a broad sense, an infographic is anything that uses visuals to communicate information. We're all familiar with what I would dub infographic style. You know, bold colors, big sans serif fonts, cute icons, we've seen, it all the, we've seen it all over the place. The style has been very popular, and it risks becoming trite, I think. Furthermore, just because it is an infographic style, it is not necessarily a true infographic. In many cases, things that are called infographics are really just text with some measure of graphic design. Imagine a spectrum. On one end is what I would call information with graphics. In other words, text-based information that has been illustrated or art directed. It may be more effective than just plain text, but the graphics don't really add any meaning. On the other end of the spectrum are what I would call data visualizations. Basically, they are charts and graphs. They present information visually, but really have no meaning without the key or legend. A true infographic, to me, lies somewhere in between. In a true infographic, the graphic design communicates information in of itself. The picture, that is, really does stand in for a thousand words. Let me give you an example. We're answering the question, how would mobile app users prefer to make routine customer service inquiries? This is the information with graphics approach. It's attractive, but the graphic design doesn't really contribute to any meaning. This is the information with graphics approach. It's attractive, but the graphic design really doesn't contribute to anything. This is the visual, data visualization approach. I mean, excuse me, this is what I believe to be a true infographic. Here, 
you get the meaning without the need for words. This example suggests some other things about true infographics. It is, as we've said, a visual representation of data. In it, graphics replace at least some of the words that would otherwise be required for understanding. Therefore, it is quick. It delivers meaning faster than reading and absorbing a sentence or understanding a graph. It has an element of being surprising, clever, or creative. It delivers an aha. And this is important. It's persuasive. I'll admit, I have a bit of a bias about communications. It's probably because, like many of you, I operate in the marketing realm. But I think the real purpose of communication is persuasion. We may be persuading people to buy or to change their behavior. We may be persuading them to change their attitudes or affiliations. Or we may be just persuading them that we're nice, knowledgeable, trustworthy people. But unless we're persuading somebody of something, communication has little purpose. And given that we're all deluged with communication all day, every day, I say if you're not trying to persuade somebody of something, then why communicate at all? But back to infographics and our definition. I believe because infographics use visual elements to increase the impact, because true infographics deliver their message quicker through a combination of visual and verbal means, they can be more persuasive and thus more valuable for our communication needs. In his book, The Best American Graphics 2013, former Talking Heads frontman David Bryan proposes this definition. An infographic, he says, will engender and facilitate an insight by visual means. Of course, the opposite can be true. If the infographic approach does not add anything, if it's really just illustrating a concept that could be presented more simply with words alone, you might want to abandon it. You, be, you might actually be slowing comprehension and losing value by adding in meaningless decoration and clutter. Here are some examples of infographics that I believe deserve the term. This is from Bloomberg Business and entitled, Who Works and Who Doesn't? The Labor Force by the Numbers. I think this is a true infographic because as long as you know it's about unemployment, you get a pretty good sense of what is being conveyed. This is a detail of an infographic called Mobile Use. Here again, you can understand the content without relying on the numbers or words. From NPR, this shows, an ad, this shows ad spending per voter dollars in 2008. The purple color comes as red Republican money mixes with blue Democratic money, greatly distorting the, the map of the United States. To me, this image is unmistakable. It may interest you to know that there is nothing new about infographics. One could argue that Paleolithic cave paintings did a pretty darn good job of communicating information through a visual meme. Slightly more recent, I have this, a diagram of the causes of mortality offered by Florence Nightingale in the 1850s to demonstrate to Parliament how many British soldiers were dying of causes other than in enemy fire during the Crimean War. Put this on the web with some big sans serif fonts, new titles, and it could have easily been created yesterday. This iconic view of Napoleon's disastrous Russian campaign was, was drawn by Charles Joseph Menard in 1869. It manages to convey six types of information, the number of Napoleon's troops, the distance traveled, temperature, latitude and longitude, direction of travel, and location relative to specific dates, all in one picture. The term infographic started appearing in the 1990s, while versions we are familiar with today really took off with blogging and social media start sharing in the 2000s. This is one reason many static infographics are presented in the long and narrow form. 
They are made for scrolling on a computer monitor, like this example, which asks, is Barbie's body possible? A very good question if you ask me. One thing that has changed very recently is our understanding and an appreciation of how and why infographics work. For this, we look to the fields of psychology and neurology. Because of the advent of tools like functional MRI scanning, our knowledge of what goes on in the brain has expanded significantly. And so, with that begins the audience participation of today's segment. I'm going to show you two images and I want to see how your brain reacts. If you're like most people, you quickly and effortlessly combine seeing this image and thinking intuitively about it. You immediately knew that this was a woman. She was angry, and she was about to say something nasty, probably loudly and unpleasantly. You didn't have to force to assess what mood she was in or predict the future. It just happened. Now let's look at another image. Okay. You might have quickly recognized that this is a math problem. You might have also had some vague sense of what the answer might be. More than one and less than a million, perhaps. You probably could not tell right away, though, that the answer was 462, unless you're some kind of math freak. And unless you are indeed that freak, you wouldn't know that I just lied. The real answer is 408. Now, if I would have given you a little more time, you might have been able to do this problem in your head. You would dredge up the process of multiplication and would have arduously computed the individual products while trying to remember what you had done before. This would be hard work. And while you did all of that, your body would change as well. Your muscles would tense, your blood pressure would go up, your eyes would dilate, and your heart rate would rise. What you just experienced is two very different modes of thinking. And for this segment, I'm indebted to a new book on the subject called Thinking Fast, and Slow by Dan Kahneman. When you saw the woman, you thought fast. This is what psychologists have begun to refer to as system one. And when you tried to work the math problem, you thought slow, or as you guessed it, you used system two. These modes have become very, dis these modes have two very distinct characteristics. System one is fast and automatic. It's effortless and amazingly good at recognizing patterns. It's the source of our impressions and feelings. Scientists believe that system one was the key to our evolution, where quick recognition of patterns might have made the difference between survival and winding, winding up as dinner for some saber-toothed tiger. System two is slow, conscious, and deliberate. It can impose order upon the impressions and feelings generated by system one. It is where we reason and where our beliefs lie. We tend to be proud of our system twos, but in addition to being slow, system two can be lazy. That's right, while system one is active and energetic and ready to provide us with all of the ideas and feelings we can handle, system two basically has to be dragged to the party. It's work and we don't like it. And now we head into another audience participation segment of today. On the next slide, say out loud to yourself or to all of those around you in cubicle land, whether the words are printed in uppercase or lowercase. Ready? Now, next slide, same task. Not so easy, is it? Now please say aloud to yourself whether the words are on the right side of the screen or the left.
Okay, one more example and we'll move on. What you've just witnessed is a demonstration of the automatic nature of System 1 in conflict with the deliberative nature of System 2. When the words agreed, for example, the word upper is printed in uppercase or the word left is on the left side of the screen, your System 1 was probably able to cruise right through while your lazy System 2 took a break. When the pattern was broken with your System 1 telling you to read the word upper, even though it was printed in lower case, your system two was reluctantly dragged back to work. In its methodical way, your system two had to override the impulses of your system one. This is not meant to say that system one is bad and system two is good. We would have to, we would drive ourselves crazy and not get much done if we had to, if we could not count on our system one for rapid, intuitive, correct decisions most of the time. Let me demonstrate for you, that for you as well. Quick, how many sevens are on the screen? Are you having a hard time picking them all out? Here, let me help you. Now you can see almost immediately how many sevens there are. This can be called pre-attentive processing, and it's an example of easing cognition for your busy system one. We've used color in this example. There are other attributes that enable system one to do a quick and accurate assessment. For example, size, shape, orientation, line length, curvature, and position. As described in the book Infographics, The Power of Visual Storytelling, this kind of pattern seeking is very important because we're able to acquire more information through our visual systems than through any other sense. By using these aids to comprehension, we can engage and deliver a message quickly calling upon system one when we're trying to reach people who do not have much time or quite frankly, a long attention span. Frankly, this is true for all of us. The old truism that some of us are visual learners, some of us are auditory learners, and some of us are kinesthetic learners has largely become discredited. We may prefer one learning type over another, but we don't necessarily learn better one way or another. In fact, in a recent TED Talk called 10 Myths of Psychology, Psychology Debunked, Ben Ambridge calls it like it is. He says, the best presentation format depends not on you, but what you're trying to learn. Could you learn to drive a car, for example, just by listening to someone tell you what to do with no kinesthetic experience? Could you solve simultaneous equations by talking through them in your head without writing them down? Could you study for, revise for your architecture exam by using um, interpretive dance if you had a kinesthetic learner? No. What you need to do is match the material to be learned with the presentation format, not you. Coleman says, that our system one generates impressions, feelings, and inclinations when endorsed by system two, these beliefs, attitudes, and intentions. I think this is quite analogous to what is going on in effective communications, particularly in regard to good infographics. If we're trying to persuade, we're trying to get our target audience member to act or think differently. We're going for change. We're trying to get a person to do something he or she would have not done anyway. Our first task is to engage system one, to present something that attracts attention and creates an immediate visceral response. 
Infographics do that by the way they replace words with pictures. You see it, you get it right away. It's much quicker and therefore more powerful than something that requires a lot of processing time. But then, with an effective infographic, system two becomes engaged as well. Having attracted your attention and generated a response, the infographic follows up with a clever or surprising twist. This makes it memorable, persuasive, and more likely to generate the action you want. There is a lot more richness in this study of System 1 and System 2. For now, we can examine infographics in this light. Are we effectively engaging those two very different modes of thinking in a way that gives our communication power? If so, we are very likely to be effective in our efforts to persuade. Now, effective infographics, pictures that do engage both System 1 and System 2, have at least three qualities that we can look for. They are appeal, comprehension, and retention. Let's take a look at these and some examples that I think embody these qualities. The first is appeal. The fact is that our infographics exist in a world that is overloaded with competing information. We are deluged with visual communication every day. So to me, appeal means standing out, grabbing the eye, delivering something that sets it apart from all of the other babble and clutter. There are two big schools of thought on how to do this. One says that the design of infographics should be clean and as simple as possible, not too far removed from the simple graphs and charts like this. Some proponents, to, propon to proponents of this style, graphic elements that do not directly communicate the data are extraneous and distracting. They call that chart junk. The other school favors graphic decoration and illustration, something like the same data presented like this. And studies show that overall, most viewers prefer this kind of presentation. Not only that, but viewers are more likely to get the message quickly and remember it longer when appropriate graphic illustration is used to add appeal. I think the answer is balance. Clearly, too much cute or clever illustration can get in the way and confuse, rather than enlighten the viewer. On the other hand, the artful use of illustration can seize and hold the viewer's attention. One type of illustration is visual metaphor, such as the monster depicted on the screen. Here's another example of a visual metaphor a literal view of how liquid Americans are. And one more, with the contents of the hypodermic needles standing in for morbidity. Another popular way to capture appeal is with symbols or iconography, as in this example. I like this, because even if the words were not there, you would get the sense of type of car crashes, the, the type of car crashes that occur with the greatest frequency just by the icons used. Or here in this infographic called misconceptions. Or in this one, where the icons stand in for various types of logical and other fallacies in reasoning. This is one of my favorites. This is famous movie quotes as charts, starting with the first. This one is, frankly, dear, I don't give a damn, from Gone with the Wind. And from Love Story. Love is, love means never having to say you're sorry. And of course, from the iconic movie Apocalypse Now, de depicting how much they love the smell of napalm in the morning. Some infographics use decorative framing to add visual appeal, like this one. 
To me, this decoration rises to the level of true infographic because the clear depiction of the 80s teen versus a 2012 teen helps you understand, without words, what is being compared here. Here's another use of decorative framing. Effective infographics have appeal, but they also promote comprehension. As we've discussed earlier, the one of the benefits of infographic is their potential to, live, to deliver understanding quickly to recipients who are pressed for time and short on attention span. This is because we humans are pattern seekers. We make sense of the, word, the world by trying to discern the patterns it presents to us. This probably has evolutionary roots. Our ancient ancestors had to become adepts, for example, at perceiving the tiger crouching amongst the tall savanna grass, one kind of pattern recognition that was of great utility. Parenthetically, the predisposition to see patterns can be our undoing as well. We often see patterns when none exist. For example, did you know that the countries with the lowest incident of kidney cancer are rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states? Well, that's true. And if you're like most people, you probably started developing patterns based on what I just told you. You might have inferred that these low kidney cancer rates were due to the clean living of people in rural, if people in rural areas due, in, due to low population, natural ingredients of food, lots of ore activities, and maybe even thought that it suggested that Republicans themselves are healthier people. That's your system too, working to make patterns to help, to help your comprehension. But guess what? The statisticians Howard Weiner and Harris Zerwin pointed out that counties with the highest incident of kidney cancer are also mostly rural, sparsely populated, and located in traditionally Republican states. Clearly, it's the poverty in the rural lifestyle, lacks of, lack of access to good medical care, high fat diets, tobacco, and alcohol use that are causing the problems. Maybe Republicans are not that healthy after all. And we, and we are obviously incorrect in drawing conclusions based upon these patterns. The real explanation for the fact that both the lowest and highest incident of kidney cancer occur in these rural counties has to do with statistics, not environmental factors. The population of rural counties tends to be small, so it is statistically a near certainty that these outliers, the highest and lowest rates of kidney cancer, occur among the smallest population samples, not in the larger population typical of, co of counties in urban democratic states on the coast. But the same propensity for pattern seeking that trips us up can also be a great help in comprehending statistical information. And the reason goes back to our system one slash system two modes of thinking. You see, humans are really not good at understanding statistics. We have to engage our slow, somewhat lazy system twos to understand percentages and tables. On the other hand, we're great at seeing patterns. So if infographic can present statistical data in a way that makes patterns clear, our comprehension can be both faster and more complete. Let me show you some infographics that I believe really help in comprehending some challenging statistical data. This is the billion dollar O-gram for 2013. The size of the boxes represent um, respective money, quantities of money, starting with the tiny amounts, like of course, Bill Gates' net worth of 67 billion, and the 410 billion we've spent on gambling versus the 486 billion 
that we have ever spent on space for exploration. All the way up to things that won't fit on my screen, like the 21 trillion that sits in offshore tax havens. This infographic is called debt ceiling increases. Increases often a last minute affair. And the scaling shows US debt rising up to hit the ceiling over and over again over the past 45 years. This one called How Google Destroyed Internet Explorer Visualized shows the market share for internet browsers over time. I think it's quite clever how it shows not only the growing dominance of Chrome, but how the top spot flipped from IE to Google's product. Here's a little bit of a scary one, the biggest data breaches. The size of the circle represents the number of people affected, arranged by year with the most recent at the top. Effective infographics, if you remember from before, as I mentioned, have appeal, promote comprehension, and also increase retention. You remember that I talked about the school of thought that says illustration and decoration should be eliminated because it interferes with the understanding of data. Actually, studies have shown that not only do most viewers prefer information graphics with an element of design and decoration, these elements can increase long-term recall. Study participants shown a series of infographics, some very plain, some with um, decorative illustration, were able to remember the information in both a few minutes later. After a couple of weeks, however, the information conveyed by the, by the more illustrated versions had been retained at a significantly higher rate. Here's an example that is as beautiful as it is sad. Excuse me. It is called Field of Commemoration. This infographic represents the casualties of 20th century wars. The size of the poppy represents those killed. The length of the stem represents the duration of the conflict. The stem grows from the year the, word, the, war, the war started, and the poppy flowers in the year the world ended. Given that yesterday was just Veterans Day, I know that this is an image that will last with me for a long time. This next graphic is sad in a little bit of a different way, demonstrating the constant wage gap between men and women. Though college-educated women have started to make up more money than non-college educated men, the gaps between men and women have increased over time. Again, obviously as a woman, this graphic very much tends to stick with me. And finally, an interactive graphic showing the human toll of drone strikes in Pakistan since 2004. In the course of killing 50 high profile targets, our drone strikes have killed some 3,200 others, including 175 children. When we talk about infographics, we usually imagine static design, the kind of image file that can be viewed, oh, excuse me, excuse me. When we talk about infographics, we usually imagine static design, the image file that can be viewed in a browser or sometimes printed out. But there are other in, but there's another dimension of infographic, one that I think points to the future of this powerful form of communication. That dimension is interactivity. Interactivity occurs on a scale, and I have adapted this from the book Cool Infographics by Randy Crum. The scale of interactivity includes zooming, clickable, animated, video, and fully inter interactive. In my addition, experimental. Static infographics are the simplest, of course, and they have some advantages. 
they can easily be posted and shared without any special coding or software needed. This example called Americans Getting Fatter and Drunker is a good example, but also points out the limitations of static infographics. Unless they are very simple and short, one must either scroll or manually zoom in all of the information. This can be okay depending on the application. But if there's even more information, or in some cases the vast amount of information is the point of the infographic, a zoomable infographic can be the solution. This genealogy of pop rock music is an example. Nothing happens when you click, but you can zoom and pan to see, uh, to see the interrelationships of the artists and the bands. The next step up is a clickable infographic. In this case, clicking on individual elements provides the detail missing in the overall view, such as this in this example that shows the tax rates of large corporations. Rolling over some of these circles reveals the company that it stands for. One concern that I have with clickable infographics is they may not work if removed from their original landing page. Once they are shared, they become static images again. This can be overcome in some cases by creating a clickable PDF file of the infographic, which can remain functional when shared across sites and devices. The next step up is animated infographics. This one represents the distance from Earth to Mars, making the case that it's a lot further than we all think. The animation lasts so long that the designer had to insert factoids to keep the viewer watching all the way to the end. And just as a side note, if you would like a bibliography of all of these various infographics that I'm presenting so that you can look at them in real time, feel free to email me and I'm happy to give you the full list so that you can look at them. In some cases, it's worth taking a step back all the way to a full video infographic. This is an example, this example, in favor of the renewable fuel standards, a subject near and dear to my heart, provides a full video graphic to animate, animate and enliven the st statistical information. How America's farmers are feeding and fueling the country and the world in 60 seconds. In 1960, the average U.S. farmer fed just 26 people. Today, that farmer feeds 155 people, growing more on every acre every year. And that's not all. America's farmers produce feed for cows, pigs, and chickens, and grow enough to fuel our cars and trucks with cleaner, renewable fuels. That's more than 13 billion gallons of renewable fuel powering our cars and 34 million tons of animal feed in 2012 alone. How do they do it? Through innovation and technology, farmers are growing more crops on the same land, more sustainably. From soybeans to corn to wheat, the yields are up by as much as 64%. Think you get the point. Fully interactive infographics can be very powerful, but they're also very complex, requiring substantial custom programming and database integration. These kinds of infographics can allow users to drill down on data in real time, displaying customized views of the information they seek. For example, this website asks, how are things where you are? and presents a multicolored graph showing relative scores on a variety of quality for life measures for the user's current location. This one I think is pretty awesome. It's called Infinite Jukebox and allows you to calculate pathways through your favorite song in order to repeat it endlessly. This, by the way, is a diagram of all about that base. The ultimate I believe, is what I call exper experiential infographics. This has much in common with what, with what has been called augmented reality, where directions, facts, figures, and interpretations are superimposed upon a real-time view of the world. In current technology, 
You access augmented reality by holding a smartphone or, in ta or a tablet in front of your face. But other, more convenient options are under development. Here at PCI, my agency, we experimented with the late lamented Google Glass. But a much more usable option, not far in the future, may be contact lenses that are capable of projecting video and text right there in front of you in your field of view. Who knows if direct implants, implants uh, in our brain is next? Slightly a little scary, but probably inevitable. I think this progression of interactivity is very exciting and probably represents the future of infographics. It is how we want and increasingly expect to receive our information. To the visual appeal and greater re comprehension and retention that good infographics provide, interactivity adds relevance the ability to focus down specifically on what we're interested in and explore. Of course, greater inter interactivity also typically calls for greater complexity. Programming, a clickable infographic can be more time consuming and expensive than simply designing the same thing in static form. And the same is true as we go up the ladder towards video fully interactive in experiential forms. There is, however, a wide variety of tools designed to make the creation of infographics, both, both static and interactive, easier. You certainly do not have to start from scratch. Here are some inexpensive and some, for, some free tools to help you in your journey. Before I present that, I did want to show this is an interesting place to start in your journey. A periodic table of visualization methods that gives you suggestions and examples of a wide variety of data visualization formats. If you're interested in obtaining this piece for yourself, you can find it at visualliteracy.org. Wordle at wordle.net is a free tool to make tag clouds. This one is a tag cloud for this presentation. Pretty meta, huh? Gezi is a tool for representing huge imported data sets, also free and open source. The Noun Project allows you to search for icons for just about anything and use or buy them at nominal prices. This is, the search, this is the search result for icons for infographic. And of course, as I'm sure all of you know, there's a growing number of online tools specifically designed for creating infographics, like easily and visually, and as you can see, many more to choose from, and I'm sure there's probably even more resources out there than I'm even naming but you can get a lot of this information at coolinfographics.com backslash tools. Yes, there are many tools for you to create infographics, but I want to interject just one note of caution. I hope that if you take away nothing else from my talk today, that you remember this one point. There's a difference between true infographics, those that appeal, build comprehension, and enhance retention and meaningless visual elements on a page. Just because you can create an infographic doesn't mean that you should create an infographic. If you are a great visual thinker and have both the skill and artistic sense needed to create infographics, then go for it. More power to you. But if you don't, consider calling upon a team, the kind of multi skilled strategists and designers who can provide for you an infographic worthy of the name. I know a few if you're interested. Because in my book, it's not enough for an infographic to be clear or clever. It must also be beautiful. So I will leave you today with a few more examples that I believe meet the standard. This one is called 37-Minute Bus Ride. 
It takes something as mundane as the daily commute and turns it into a beautiful piece of art. This dramatic visualization shows just one week of earthquakes in California, with the length of lines representing the hypocentric depths. Pretty cool, huh? And to show that we in the U.S. have no monopoly on outstanding infographic design, this one answers the question, what, profession, what professions are most happy? Well, I, for one, am very happy that you all had a t the time to join us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and, and uh, withstanding a few of my technical glitches. Um, and I hope that, you, that you've seen that an infographic can be worth a thousand words. Thank you very much. And with the few minutes that uh, we have left, Lindsay, can I uh, have, a, have a question? Yes, we do have a couple of questions that came through during the presentation. Um, we can start with, let me see. Casey had asked you to repeat what was the website for the icons that you were talking about a couple slides ago. Uh, Visualthesource.com. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, I misspoke. Visualliteracy.org. Okay. And then and again, we have. Oh, oh, sorry, one real, real quick, Lindsay. Sorry to cut you off. Okay, no, you're um, fine. Again, um, please tweet at me if you'd like the full bibliography of all, all of the infographics plus all of the websites, books, everything that I've mentioned throughout my presentation, I, I have that ready to go. So if you'd like that, feel free to tweet at me or contact me at my email address and I'm happy to provide you with, with all of those references. Okay. Continue. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, Michelle uh, Bertolone, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, but asked about if you could talk about the importance of headlines and subheads. Oh, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's great. Um, I believe that in an infographic, and we saw in a couple of the examples that I showed throughout, to, in, in the examples that I felt truly embodied what, what an infographic is, I am not a heavy emphasis on the headline or the subhead. I really want to get to the meat of the content that I'm trying to get the the person to retain um, because truly it's about the larger piece of meat and not so much about the headline or subhead because if you're if you're um, showing your infographic effectively, they'll be able to to retain that that information rather quickly and so I don't feel a need to put so much emphasis on the um, uh, uh, the headline or the subhead. I really think the meat, the body of what you want people to know, um, is is a little more uh, a little more important. Now, of course, I'm sure there might be a, a graphic designer or two uh, on the line who may want to strangle me at this point, and I apologize. But but my feeling um, is that the, the the graphic as a whole is far more important than putting emphasis on the on the the head or or subhead. Okay, um, Michael, um, and I'm going to butcher your last name. So Michael <laughs> asked, what kind of talent or people are needed to conceptualize infographics on a regular basis? Yeah, um, so as I, as I mentioned in the, the, the conclusion of my presentation, th there really are two, two people, and, and God bless you if you embody both of these. Um, both of these abilities, we actually have a, a person or two here at PCI that does, and I, I find them incredibly amazing humans. Um, uh, you really kind of need that one, that, that, that right brain, that being able to, to draft out the flow of what it is that you're trying to convey, getting those data points put together. And then there's that creative person on the other side that can look at these data points 
and bring them to life, whether that's in static form or um, in a video or a clickable um, infographic. You really need someone that, that or two people. Um, there are some worlds where it's two individuals that it takes to develop the infographic, but you really need that person that can boil down the issue into the data points or put it into a logical flow, and then someone on the creative side um, that can that can take those data points and 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 flesh it out into something that that is not only beautiful but is quickly um, uh, easy for all of us to um, to retain. So it's 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 both left and and right side of the brain. And like I said, there there are humans in this world that that possess both sides. Um, our uh, CEO here at, at PCI, I believe, is one of those people. Um, but there's also places where it, it, it takes a village and there and there's two people required. Um, but those are really the two main uh, uh, skill sets that we're looking for when when building a building an infographic. Um, Michelle had another question. She asked about if you could um, talk about how to select cor the correct amount of content based on audience, age, attention span, um, some of those different factors. Okay, so I I'm, I'm going to throw out the, the response that, that everybody hates that a, a presenter print, uh, throws out there. Uh, I'm going to start by saying it depends. Um, it depends on the audience. It depends on the platform. Um, it depends on um, uh, you know what you're trying to convey. As you saw in, in a lot of the examples that I provided throughout my presentation, there were varying degrees of, of all of those of all of those elements. But let's let's uh, let's pull one example to to give a more concrete example. Like for example, um, if you're doing a ad in a magazine. And you think about, you know, let's say, for example, that you're doing an, uh, an ad for a product in, in Style Magazine, one of my favorite um, magazines to read. And you know that women who read in Style, or men, sorry, I don't mean to exclude guys, um, people who read in Style Magazine are a particular demographic. And you're trying to convey to them that using a new, you know, in being interested in a new blow dryer, a new product is the way to go, and you're trying to demonstrate that in an ad. Um, one, I would say less is more. Um, the visuals are going to have to be strong, they're going to have to be bold, they're going to have to be quick, because most people flip through a magazine very quickly, um, and you only have their attention for a very split second of time. And so depending on what you're trying to sell and, and um, I'm rambling. Let me regroup here. Um, depending on what it is that you're trying to say, um, will determine the amount of data. Obviously, for an uh, an ad, you want to keep the points as as quick as humanly possible because you're only going to have those people for a moment of time. Um, however, if you're creating a, a video or um, something that's clickable, obviously you can go into a, a little more depth. Um, I hate to be vague, but it really does depend on what it is you're trying, what's the target audience, and, and the, the platform in which you're, you're, um, you're, you're showing it. Okay. Let's see, we've got a couple more. Um, someone wants to know what program you use to make this presentation. So this, uh, this actually, this presentation was developed in Keynote. <laughs> I do all my presentations in Keynote. Um, so if you are a, a diehard Mac user like, like I am, uh, it's right there on your computer. Um, any tips on working with staff that want an infographic, they think they are neat, but also want a million words on the page? They feel that the information has to be explained to the viewer. Yeah, uh, I, I've been there. So uh, whoever submitted this question, I definitely feel your pain. Um, I think it, when, when thinking about an infographic, um, go right back to the beginning of my presentation when I say, is it effective or is it really standing in the way of, of what it is that we're trying to communicate? Um, 
infographics are great. They're a lot of fun, but sometimes they're not appropriate for, for what it is that you're trying to convey to the audience. Um, sometimes, it, you know, another form of communication or another form of design um, is more appropriate. Um, so that's the first question to ask the team, um, is what we're trying to convey to our target audience appropriate for an infographic or is it really better served um, through a different, a different mechanism? Um, if there's too much data, um, if you start, you know, if you, you're amazing designer starts fleshing this out and it's just too much, there's too much on the page, is there anywhere you can cut? Is there anywhere where you can scale back? Um, because again, we want to make sure that it's, it, that, it's, that it's simple, that it's easy, that people get to the point very, very quickly. And if, and if you know the content and you're looking at the page and can't discern what it is, just imagine how difficult that's going to be for your audience. So it, it has to be the right it has to be the right mechanism, and the and the data has to be in a size that's that's um, uh, easy for people to digest. Now, of course, I understand when working with a large group of people, you know, there's going to be everyone's got an opinion, everybody's um, got an agenda, um, but you really need to step back and say, okay, you know, if we can't understand what this is very quick, very easy, then our audience isn't either. Um, you know, go back to the beginning of my presentation when I showed um, the mobile user representation about customer service requests. In one slide, you saw very quickly and very easily that people overwhelmingly would rather go through mobile means rather than actually talking on the phone to handle their customer service issues. Think of it that way when developing your infographic. If I can't look at that page and quickly discern what it is you're trying to educate me about, then, then infographic might not be the platform um, in which to convey that message. Okay, so maybe one more question um, and then we'll wrap it up. So have you ever heard of anyone doing a series or serial of related infographics over weeks or months? Are there pros, cons? Um, they have a lot of data stories to tell. Um, I have not, myself, I have not seen a um, succession, uh, you know, a series of, of ads or um, uh, um, outreach based on um, infographic, but I would love to seek that out and find an answer uh, for you. Lindsay, will you capture that person and I will, uh, I will tap into my resources and, and find an answer for that person? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. I will forward thank this along. Thank you. All right. Well, th thank you everyone for attending today. Um, if we didn't get to any of your questions or if you have additional questions that you think of pertaining to infographics or about PCI, Feel free to reach out to Francis at frymers at pcicom.com. Um, we'll follow up with a recording of this webinar within the next week and also our contact information. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day, and please let us know if you have any questions.